Hello, everybody, and welcome to the very first inaugural Future in Space Hangout. And we're, we can, we're very excited to bring this to you this Friday. My name is Tony Darnell. I am, I am the owner of the Deep Astronomy YouTube channel. I, am also, I also work at the Space Telescope Science Institute. And today we, we're trying a, a, a brand new series of hangouts, of the frequency of which are still being determined. But right now, we're probably going to try and do this once a month, where we attempt to take a look at not just uh, some of the science that's going on in astronomy and current science, but we want to look into the future and see what it would be like, what, what can we expect from science, uh, not just in astronomy and, and things like that, but also in aeronautics, because this is a sort of a joint effort for to give members of both the American Astronomical Society and the American Astronautical Society and and don't you know that those two acronyms have given us a lot of headaches so far. But yes, they're both double AS. Uh, one focusing on the science and the other one on the engineering aspects of studying in space and astronomy. And so we're going to try and highlight some of these by bringing you members of both organizations to talk about a variety of topics. And today we're going to be talking about exoplanets. And we've titled this The Multitude of Planets. And we, and we have a great, we have two of some of the most amazing guests here to talk to us about that. But before I do, let me introduce my cohorts in this endeavor, Dr. Alberto Conti. He is the you know, no, you used to be the innovation scientist. Now you're some kind of uh, you got, you, you're some kind of bigwig in Northrop Grumman, uh, who, are, who is a company that's also building the James Webb Space Telescope. My old friend Alberto Conti, welcome. It's good to see you back. It's good to see you, Tony. I'm very, very excited for today's hangout. It's uh, it's been a long time coming, and I think it's uh, it's going to be great. Yeah, so he's going to be joining us as with every one of these. Also joining me is Dr. Harley Thronson. He's at the he's an astronomer at the Goddard Space Flight Center. Hi, Harley. This was your brainchild, actually, wasn't it? This was sort of yep, stemmed yep. from. Yeah, yep. I'm, a, I'm from, a member of both AASs. I may be the only member of both AASs. Oh come on, really? I think that might be the case. In any case, uh, both seem to be seriously interested. In the um, in areas of, of overlapping interest, science, technology, new missions, and the future. So happy to have helped get this started. Right, and uh, so and we look forward to a lot more coming up, and we're going to let you know as those those come along on the Deep Astronomy channel as well as the uh, uh, other social media channels that we'll be creating along the line. Now, before I introduce my guests, let me tell you how you can interact with us. We want you to give us questions. We want to hear. We want to read your comments, and so there's several ways you can do that. The easiest way and the way that I would prefer is if you clicked on the little Q&A app, which you will see in the YouTube page and the, uh, the video page on, on the, in the Google Plus Hangout, if you just click on that little thing that says Q&A, you can ask your question and it will magically appear right here next to me where I can read it. That's the easiest way. Another way is you could also comment on the G Plus page and the YouTube comment page for which this is being broadcast. I'm monitoring both of those. Also, you can tweet at us using the Future in Space Hashtag, I have it right down here. It's just all spelled out. So use that on Twitter, and I will look at it, and we'll read your comments and questions as we go along uh, to our very esteemed guests. So let me get to our introductions. With me is Dr. Na uh, joining me is Dr. Natalie Battaglia. She's from NASA Ames. You're number third one away, Natalie. I don't know what happened. Anyway, uh, she, she is a... She was a member of the Kepler, or she is a member of the Kepler mission, which we will be talking a lot about. She's also uh, involved in a lot of other aspects at NASA. So thank you, Natalie, for joining us. Also, Dr. S uh, Professor Sarah Seeger, she is at uh, MIT, and she's also a McFell uh, Arthur, MacArthur Fellow. Uh, we, I, I am so pleased to have her back on one of my hangouts. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Tony. It's great to be back with you and with Alberto, too. Yeah, I know. She, she was one of our first uh, Hangout guests when we were when Hangouts just started out. She was one of our first people right. to take the plunge. And and so if I may say, you know, we come, you know, we come a long way with this. Right? And we started, you and I started a long time with Space Telescope, and then it turned into Hubble Hangouts. And uh, so it's nice to see that they're expanding into some, uh, some other areas, including engineering. I think it's going to be really cool. Yes, and I'm, I'm happy to. So in, in any way we can find new new ways of uh, getting the word out via these hangouts, I'm happy to take part in. So that's great. So, okay, let's get started on some exoplanets. Uh, I guess the, most of you know what they are, but uh, I'll, I'll just say right now, exoplanets are planets that orbit other stars. And most recently we have been uh, inundated with lots of new information on exoplanets and so Natalie I want to get you going on this first because you were you, were, you worked with Kepler a very famous uh, very famous uh, uh, telescope and uh, lots of good things came out of it 
But the study of exoplanets is actually a pretty new one, isn't it? It hasn't been going on for very long. That's right. Um, let's see, about 20 years ago was the detection or the announcement of the discovery of the first exoplanet orbiting a normal star, a star that's fusing hydrogen in its core. Um, I happened to be at that conference where Michelle Mayor, a Swiss astronomer, announced that discovery. I was just a young graduate student at the time uh, and didn't fully appreciate the import of that discovery. Um, but over the years, a lot of us that were doing stellar astrophysics at the time, uh, studying how stars behave, ended up getting sucked into this uh, new discipline of exoplanet research. And it, it really took off uh, quite quickly. Uh, the discoveries came in at an ever increasing, in ever increasing numbers. Uh, the sensitivity was getting better as new instruments came online. And so uh, we had new techniques that were employed. Uh, we had the Doppler wobble method that started out with that first discovery of 51 peg B. Uh, we had some pulsar transit uh, or pulsar timing uh, detections. Uh, we've had some direct imaging detections. Um, but the method that Kepler uses to detect exoplanets, called the transit method, um, didn't see its first success until the year 2000. Um, and in that year, the planet HD 209458 that had first oh, been... Oh, great name. Oh, yeah. how romantic. <laughs> Hopefully soon it it'll get a new sexier name. Uh, so, so in that, I mean, that, that planet was initially discovered by the Wobble method, um, but it was being monitored by the, on the ground with um, telescopes that measure the brightness of the star very accurately. Um, as many stars at the time were being monitored, stars known to harbor planets, uh, in the hopes that some of them would have a geometry so that the planet in its orbit around the star would pass directly between the disk of the star and the telescope. Yeah, now mm -hmm. I to, I'm going to show a graphic of that in just a minute, but let me go back to something you said a while ago. So the very first star, what was it called? The very first planet, what, what did you say, 51 peg? That was it? Yeah, that, that was the first one orbiting a normal star. Kind and of you method. found that with this sort of wobble method, and then uh, then later on in the early 2000s they were finding it with the transit method. Weren't those early efforts pretty um, modest? I mean, my favorite exoplanet story that I like to tell is I worked at the High Altitude Observatory in the late 90s with, uh, uh, I, I think it was, it was a Bob Brown and also Dave Charbonneau was a, a grad student at the time. Yeah. And, and they were using Mead, I think, 16-inch telescopes in the parking lot to look at these stars. And I, they may not have found the first ones, but they were among the first, right? They were those early efforts. Uh, well, uh, that, that very first, well, they were trying, they were using the transit method. So they were using these very small telescopes to measure the brightnesses of stars. Okay. Um, so they were monitoring a lot of the stars that have, um, that were known through this wobble method. Uh, people like Dave Charbonneau in those early years uh, were doing surveys, measuring the brightnesses of many stars in the hopes that they would find some of these with this right geometry. Um, and so many years went by and we were not successful uh, in those early years. It took a lot of time. Uh, the reason that you can do this with a Mead, a small Mead telescope, is that the stars you're looking at are really bright. So you're inundated by photons from uh -huh. these stars. Um, and you're really limited from the ground um, by the atmosphere, which introduces uh, what we call scintillation noise. Right, and the other point that's maybe relevant for later is that people were aiming to find a signal that's about 1%. Like, you know, do I ever make a measurement at 1%? Right. Many people do. You measure like the width of something you're going to build to a percent. It's not uncommon. And so that's the other reason why people were able to succeed from the ground. But Natalie and I and many others were involved independently in these transit surveys initially, and not too many of them worked out. Oh, what yeah, do you mean? It's a, it's a tough problem. Oh, um, I see. You, you've got the scintillation noise from the atmosphere. You've got a lot of systematic effects that you have to correct out. Um, but I think it was also just a learning curve. Yeah, everything uh, looks mm -hmm. like a transit. Systematics tend to look like transits, funnily yeah. enough. That's right. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, well I, get the to other, I think the other but, reason that made it difficult was that we were just learning about how other astrophysical signals in nature can fool us, can mimic um, a planet transit. Namely, you've got stars in the universe that are in the galaxy that are orbiting one another and causing eclipses. And, and so those can seep into your measurements, into your brightness measurements. Is that what you meant by systematic, Sarah? No, I meant more like instrument systematics. Oh, okay. Um, you see yeah. something that looks like a partial transit, but then you see that so many stars have that same effect at the same time, and so you know that's not a transit. But 
Natalie's group and the group, my group and others, we all discovered the blend at the same time. Um, so FYI, I was sort of, um, the whole hangout could be Natalie and I just chatting and reminiscing. Actually, was there any time when... Uh... As soon as I saw Natalie, all I could think of was how much I want to catch up. <laughs> 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 it's actually good that you got Sarah and I in the same place because people often confuse us in the public. So okay. now, well, now we can show their are actually, two, okay. yeah. now actually it's yeah, two people. <laughs> two distinct people. Good. I'm glad we were able to establish was that. There, so, let me ask you this, if you're reminiscing both of you. So was there any time where you were uh, kind of discouraged and you thought that things were not going the right way in terms of the systems on the, on the telescopes or anything that, you know, discouraged you from, uh, from seeing that something was coming, which eventually my, did? Yeah. My, my very first project in Exoplanets um, was to build a transit survey that was the precursor to the Kepler mission today. It mm -hmm. was a ground-based survey called Vulcan. And the thing about these ground-based surveys that we're trying to find planets with this transit method is that we were inundated by these astrophysical false positives. That's right. Vulcan, our ground-based telescope, was finding tons of these signals, right? They looked like planets. We got very excited about a lot of them until we finally realized over the years that over 60% of the signals we were seeing were due to uh, were due to these eclipsing binaries. So you're really just inundated by them, and that that was really frustrating. And we really actually started good. writing a paper about the first planet ever discovered by the transit method, and we were writing it, writing it, writing it. We were so excited, and then we had gotten a spectrum, and we had realized that the light curve um, and what it told you about the host star actually didn't match up what the spectrum was telling you. It turned out there were two stars, and there was actually an eclipsing in a binary. Oh, wow. around one of the stars. So actually, then we discovered the blend. That wasn't news, of course. So fortunately, we didn't declare that we discovered a planet this way. So there's a lot of stuff going on. But okay. the thing is, I was less discouraged, and um, <laughs> um, discouraged, but the thought was that so many groups were working so hard on this problem. Look, you just randomly got two you didn't know about mm -hmm. that we would eventually succeed. And some groups stuck it out and found lots and lots of transits from the ground. But I wow. think it does speak, you know, to both of you, it does speak to <clears throat> somehow how uh, both science and engineering company has to come together just to satisfy, you know, the scientific, the scientific quest, if you will. So, so I think uh, I'm very pleased that it actually worked out. Yeah, engineering not just in terms of um, the instrument itself, but also right. the software that you use to process the data Absolutely. to remove a lot of the systematics and to deal with the, the effects of the atmosphere, etc. Luckily, Kepler doesn't have those effects. We're That's above right. the atmosphere. That's so. right. All right, before we get too much further, I want to, I want to share my screen again because we, we talked about this briefly, but I didn't show the little diagram, so here it is. This is what you're talking about with the uh, transit method. Uh, this is... Uh, these little tiny, you, you can see, it requires a certain geometry, right? So, so Natalie, why don't you explain this diagram to us? That's right. So what you're seeing here is a uh, planet, a planetary system orbiting a star uh, in a geometry so that the orbital plane is almost in your line of sight. And so when that happens, that planet casts its shadow out into the galaxy, and in this geometry, that shadow sweeps across the face of your telescope. Now, your telescope doesn't see a star and a little black disk. All you have is a bunch of voltages that you're measuring on your, on your detector and turning those into a brightness measurement. Um, but when the planet passes across, you, you measure a dimming of light, and that's represented underneath the, the picture. Um, you have a plot of brightness as a function of time. And so the, the black disk that's being shown here in this cartoon, that's a huge planet, right? That's <laughs> right. A, Compared to the star, yeah. There, right? it's, it's gigantic. I mean, Jupiter is, is about one-tenth the size of our sun. Um, so that, as Sarah mentioned earlier, that causes a dimming of light of about 1% or one part per 100. Um, imagine 100 light bulbs and you take away one. Well, that's pretty easy to measure. Um, an Earth doing this same thing uh, takes out uh, one part per 10,000 of light. Um, so it's a, an, an extremely small signal. So you see that the science, the method, is really simple, right? It's very elegant. It's very simple. What makes this really difficult and why it took so long to accomplish the detection of Earth-sized planets is that you need extreme sensitivity of your instrument to be able to measure brightness to within some parts per million accuracy. Good. Now, I want to get to Kepler in just a little bit uh, in particular, but I'm, let me talk about this real quick. This is the... Uh, this is the what you're calling the, the uh, Doppler method. Hold on, I'm getting a little my my 
somehow my thing got weird. Okay, so here is what we're calling the Doppler method. Uh, you want to you want to give that some idea? Give us some idea what we're looking at here. Yeah. Again, um, we're not That's detecting we're not detecting the planet directly. Um, we are observing properties of the star and inferring the existence of the planet. And in this case, we're capturing the starlight and we're spreading that light out into a spectrum. So you've got all of the different colors stacked out and you're, you're looking at, at features in that spectrum as shown in the bottom left of this diagram. Every black line that you see superimposed on the red, orange, yellow, green, blue is an atmospheric fingerprint, um, particular to some element in the atmosphere that's absorbing light. And so what's important to know about the Doppler method is that as planets orbit stars, stars also orbit their planets. Um, in fact, they're orbiting about their common center of mass. And what that means is that the star is moving ever so slightly in this tiny, um, tight little orbit. So as the star approaches you, these black bands shift either to, well, to the blue when it's approaching you and towards the red end of the spectrum as it moves away from you. And so measuring how much they're shifting back and forth tells you something about the speed of that orbit and then that tells us how much mass or how much gravitational tug is being exerted on this star by its orbiting companion. And so with that method you measure the mass, unlike the transit method, where what you're measuring is the size of the disk or the radius. Of oh, that's a good. I'm glad you brought that up. So each has its own ways of uh, of telling you information about the planet itself. That's and right. yeah, so okay, good. So that's how we find exoplanets. These are the two main ways. There's also other others that are being developed. Uh, but I want to go. In, I want. I want to segue in just a little bit uh, into uh, Kepler because Kepler uses the transit method. Now, now, sir, let me just first of all ask you this: if we're using the transit method to find these little tiny dips in brightness. Aren't we kind of introducing a bias there? We're, we're missing a lot of them, aren't we? Aren't we missing a lot of planets that would ordinarily yeah, be? I, I, thought, I thought I heard you ask Sarah the question, but I can... Oh, okay, go ahead. Yeah, I go ahead. you're the same person. You can interchange. You're introducing a calculated bias. So you can basically know you'll only see a fraction of the objects that are out there, but assuming that there's lots and lots of similar objects out there, you're not really missing anything in that regard. Oh really? You can so you can calculate this. You can figure out the bias. That's right. Yeah. So for for a planet like if if you have a planet like um, HD two hundred nine four five eight, which is a Jupiter sized planet in an orbital period that's just a few days, so it's very close to its parent star, the probability of having that geometric alignment is something like ten percent. Oh, okay. um, but for an Earth-Sun analog, a planet like Earth in the Earth's orbit, orbiting a star like our Sun, that probability drops to like a half of 1%. It becomes very tiny. Um, because the farther away the planet is, the tinier of an angle it requires to sweep you out of that uh, alignment geometry. Wow. Hey, Tony, I see a question there which is actually relevant for now. Do you mind if I go ahead and... Uh... I was going to no. get to it. I'm driving oh, for the internet. I'll do it. <laughs> okay. So here we have our first comment, for our first question from the Q&A app. It's from Kittles P on the Q&A. He's asking, and this it is relevant to what we're discussing right now, how does the variability of light from a star affect the detection of exoplanets? Hmm. And I'll leave that to either one of you to, 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 to answer. The, so uh, if you've got a star that's varying in brightness. Yeah. Does, that help, does that help or hurt or have any effect at all? on your ability to find a planet around it. Yeah, interestingly, a little historical note, um, Kepler, the Kepler mission was proposed to NASA four times before it was actually selected. So that means it was rejected four times before it was uh, finally selected in the fifth go-around. And in the fourth proposal, one of the things that the reviewers came back and said was, listen, you're never going to be able to see this signal from a tiny Earth because the sun has like sunspots and they're rotating in and out of view as the sun is spinning. So they're going to give the same kind of a signal. Um, that was the concern, at least, and that's actually why I got involved with Kepler back in, in uh, the year 2000, uh, was exactly for that reason. Um, so here's the thing. Yes, it's true. Stars are varying. They've got magnetic processes. They've got star spots. They do flares, all of these different kinds of things. Um, but the, the question that's really important is how are they varying on the transit time scale? That is, on that time scale that it takes for the planet to cross, a, to cross 
the stellar disk, which is usually a few hours to maybe 12 hours. And it turns out that stars are typically much quieter on that time scale. So that means you can design a computer algorithm that filters all of the different kind of variability out that you don't care about and preserves that hourly or hour to hour time scale and that enables you to see the transit uh, signature in the data. It looks yeah, characteristically sure. very very different than um, like a spot going in and out of view which is on the spin time scale of the star which like for our sun is you know on the order of a month or a little bit less. Um, so that's a completely different time scale than the one that we're interested in, which is hour to hour. Okay, so th that was a good question. Thank you very much for that. So, a point to that. Sometimes, okay, variability, sometimes variability is a problem, and there's some stars that just may get discarded because they're too variable. Other times, mm -hmm. spots have been used to an advantage, actually. And what people have been able to do is, by seeing when the planet transit covers a spot, it covers spots, because the spots move around the star parallel to the star's equator. Mm. That transit can happen in a variety of places, we've found out now. You can actually get the planet orbit with respect to the rotation axis of the star. Tony, you might want to like, rephrase that in a way that people can understand it better. <laughs> well, I, think you, I think you did beautiful, but you might want to turn down your volume a little bit because I was getting a little feedback, I think, when you were in your speakers. Just a little bit so that it, it's not quite as loud going into your mic, and I think that would help. So... Well, one of the things, uh, maybe I'll just add one more note. I think this is an interesting um, question. Well, one of the things that we did to argue why Kepler would still work is we said, well, okay, some stars are going to be so variable that you still wouldn't be able to see the planet transit. It's going to mask it. Those are primarily the young, magnetically active stars that are spinning more rapidly. Um, but let's take what we know about the galaxy and how s the rate at which stars form in the galaxy and let's estimate the numbers of stars that will be young compared to the number that would be sufficiently old and quiet. And so we showed that we could select, we had enough stars to choose from, that yes, we'd have to discard maybe 30% of them as not being um, beneficial or, or amenable to the detection of an Earth, but the other 70% are going to be just fine. Okay, well, so we've covered pretty well, I think, the exoplanets, how we find them, and some of the errors in finding them, and some of the tricky parts in it. But And before I get to that, and I want to go to the future, but but right now that we can't leave this without talking about Kepler. Kepler did some stuff, I'm told, <laughs> with exoplanets. I don't know. It found a, one or two, I think. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you guys can talk about that a little bit. But Kepler stared at one area of the sky for a very long time, the con near the constellation of Cygnus. It looked at roughly 160,000 stars and was looking for these tiny variations in brightness that Natalie and Sarah were talking about, and they found some, didn't they, guys? Who wants to talk yeah. about? It? Who wants to? Who wants to tell us that, Natalie? You want to? What did What did Kepler find? What's so great about Kepler? Well, you need to add um, times 10 to the third to your number. Uh, Kepler, <laughs> uh, as you said, it stared at this one region of sky for about, well, for four years, actually, almost exactly. Um, and we're still analyzing that data. In fact, Kepler's not over. We still have two years of analysis left, and we expect to find more planets. Um, but so far, we have found uh, over 4,000 transit-like signals, so these periodic dimmings of light that are consistent with the uh, planet interpretation with a confidence level or likelihood of something like 90% or higher. So of these 4,000, that means that some of them will be astrophysical signals that, that mimic planets that we still haven't been able to discard. But about 90% um, are expected to be bona fide planets. Look at that. Um, See, so here I have a little schematic, a little cartoon showing where uh, where Kepler is in the galaxy, right next to our sun, and where <laughs> it was sort of looking, and uh, and uh, it looked in that area of the sky near the near the constellation Cygnus. And this, as Natalie was about to get to, is was sort of the punchline here. Here are a yeah. lot of lot of dots. Yeah, so this is a scatter plot of um, the planet size on the y-axis is measured by its radius. There are some horizontal lines there to guide your eye. For comparison, we've got an Earth line, a Neptune line, and a Jupiter line. And on the x-axis, we have the orbital period. That's the time it takes between these dimmings of light. It's the time it takes for the planet to orbit once. Um, and so well, there are dots of different colors here. 
Um, the blue dots are the planets that were discovered by this Doppler wobble method that we talked about earlier. Some of the blue dots extend down like towards the Neptune line and underneath that yellow cluster. But, but over 85% of the known exoplanets even today that have been discovered by all other methods um, are larger than Neptune. Uh, the pink points that you see here were some of the ground-based transit surveys, like the one that discovered HD 209458 and, and um, others, mostly clustering right there at the Jupiter line, so and, and short orbital periods on the left side of the diagram. Um, the yellow points represent Kepler's discoveries as of January 2015, over 4,000 discoveries, and what I think is really marked about this diagram um, is that really our veil, the veil has been lifted to, to the small planets that populate the galaxy. In this diagram, now over 85% of the discoveries are smaller than Neptune and extend all the way down to the Earth line. I know there's a lot of dots in between Earth and Neptune there. That's pretty amazing. And here you sort of have another graph that sort of uh, illustrates yeah. this point. So this is the same thing shown in histogram form. Um, what, what I'm showing here is the fraction of, of planets of different sizes in that sample. And so we go from um, 0.5 to 0.7 on the far left. That's kind of Mars-sized. Um, and then you've got the brown bars that are kind of meant to represent maybe what we think of as terrestrial planets in our own solar system. On the far right, we've got like the Jupiter-sized planets that are out beyond 11 Earth radii. So those final two bars working down to four Earth radii, which would be a Neptune. So the blue represents all the things that we think about as the outer gas giants, Neptune, Uranus, Jupiter, Saturn, things with hydrogen and helium-rich envelopes. But what I, I know, but this seems pretty huge to me. Look at all of these planets between that are roughly the size of the Earth. There's a lot of them in here. That's there there are, nice. yeah, there are. I think over a thousand just in that one, in the in the brown bars. But what I also think is really exciting about this is the gray area in between. Literally, the gray area in between. <laughs> So right you've, got the, you've got the solar system planets kind of lined up at the top for reference, and uh, you, you see that there's this gap between Earth and, and the giant planets, or between the terrestrial planets and the giant planets, where in our own solar system we have nothing. Right? So between an Earth radius and a Neptune radius, our own solar system has nothing, and yet that is the so, range of sizes for which the, those, those are the most common planets known to humanity, are these these things that we don't have any representative examples of. Amazing. So just to, just to put it into context, so how much of a surprise was for, for was this for both of you that they're so that you know planets of Earth like size or a little larger are so common? Well by the time this result came out we knew to not be too surprised because so many surprises have happened many mm -hmm. times over. But I will say I actually think this is probably the biggest discovery in exoplanets so far. Is that the most common type of planet in our galaxy is one that no one had imagined. Yeah. As far as the the size distribution, um, well, a couple of things here. I mean, because what, what you said, the way you phrased your question was also about um, the fact that small planets are very common. And in fact, right. if, you look, if you look at that diagram, it doesn't really tell you that, right? The, no, the kind of. I mean, this is a lot. That's I mean, next well, to the gray. Okay. But, but, would you, but you can't say from that diagram that small planets are the most common type of planet in the galaxy. Yeah, it almost okay. looks like it's not, right? But the, the thing is that even though Kepler has lifted this veil to the small planets in the galaxy, there still remains observational biases. In other words, those small planets are also the hardest to detect. So the numbers that you see reflected there aren't representative of the actual fraction of planets of that size in the galaxy. You You're have saying to they're correct. underrepresented? They're underrepresented. Underrepresented, yeah. that's right. And we can talk about this later, but I, I also have some graphics that show what happens shows what happens when you do correct for that bias. And then indeed it turns out that small planets are the most common planets um, in the galaxy. Uh, so I, I, uh, Sarah, do you have anything to add to what, what we've been with these, these uh, diagrams? Sure. I mean, the point is that these planets of two to one and a half or two to three times the size of Earth, people, I just want to emphasize, do not understand how they form. We actually thought that the end of the planet would be a giant planet as the planet is born and starts creating 
planetesimals gets bigger and bigger until like a giant vacuum cleaner it would suck in everything in its surroundings and so the end product would be the biggest planet possible like Jupiter. So actually these two or three Earth-sized planets are really really puzzling. Um, the fact that these small planets are even more common is just so exciting. I mean that's what we're motivated for for the future. We wanted Kepler to tell us that small planets were common and Kepler delivered. Okay, I'm going to ask this question, and you guys can laugh at me if you want to, but I want to know, does this say anything, the fact that the planet sizes are, I'm going to, you know, even if they're twice as big as Earth, this is still possible, I think. What does it say, if anything, about the possibilities of life? I know we're going to, you know, the water is important and everything else, but do you think this helps anything about the possibilities of life, or could we find it even in Jupiter-sized planets, in size really doesn't make that difference. No, you understand what I'm actually. saying? Well, the main thing, actually, I want everyone to keep in mind is temperature. If the temperature is too hot, then molecules can't form. And without molecules and very complicated molecules, actually, we can't have building blocks for life. And so, actually, on Jupiter, even though we always think of it as so cold, Jupiter's actually hot. Because as, if you could travel down through the atmosphere of Jupiter, it gets hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter, deeper inside. So as long as the planet isn't too big, um, there's certainly a chance for life, but once you get into a planet with a like big gas envelope, it acts like a big blanket. It traps all the heat that somehow got into the interior of the planet. Okay, so yeah, I guess that as as I should have mentioned in the beginning, it, there's a lot of uh, a lot of factors. I guess that would that would go into what the possibility of life. The size was one of them I thought would be pretty important, but even you're pointing out that the uh, distance and the temperature, which is a function of a lot of things, whether it has an atmosphere, how far away it is from a star, all kinds of things, are probably even more important. Now, Berto, you like you want to say something? Am I keeping no, you? I was just gonna, no, no, I was just I was just going to say that I think it's, uh, this is actually shows uh, the importance of uh, you know asking very hard questions, getting some answers, and then re revising our theory of what what things look like and how they are. I think it's very important. I think the role of Kepler has been absolutely fundamental in opening that window over the last few years of exoplanets. I mean, he's telling us things that we didn't know, and I think that's pretty fundamental. Okay. You know, Go I... Ahead. Did you want to say something, Harley? Yeah, I was just going to say that, uh, as, uh, as we all know, and in fact, as, as our guests in particular uh, know, that there has been speculation uh, for centuries, um, and increasingly educated uh, speculation for decades, about what we would find when we finally did discover planets out there. But um, nothing beats actually going out and observing. Yes. Um, that's been what's, what has, uh, I guess from a philosophical point of view, what's been so important about Kepler, uh, about the mission, is that um, there were a number of surprises that no one expected. Um, yeah. But I have a question uh, uh, for Sarah, that the, the, the super-Earths, you know, the one to two, two and a half times the mass of um, the Earth, um, were unexpected, just as you say, but there has been some speculation, has there not been educated speculation, about what, um, not only about the process for formation, about what these things are, whether or not they have tectonics, or what kind of an atmosphere they might have. Is that not the case? Yes, but the question is, has there been any um, conclusive research? <laughs> and that answer is no. We just believe in this hypothesis that anything is possible within the laws of physics and chemistry, and I'm sure that when observations come to help us understand what is out there, we will find a huge range of options. So for example, some of these planets could be giant rocky worlds with thin atmospheres or gas envelopes of hydrogen. Others might be a new kind of planet we're imagining, we call them water worlds. They'd be like a scaled up version of one of Jupiter's icy moons. So to some respect, we've we're, we, me and the rest of the community is trying to cover all possibilities, including that life could exist in hydrogen-rich planets and create biosignature gases. There, there have been, um, there's been a lot of effort to follow up some of these Kepler discoveries uh, with telescopes that can detect the Doppler wobble. And then you get the mass of the planet. And that's really valuable because if you have both the radius from Kepler and you have the mass from the Doppler wobble, now you can calculate mass divided by volume, which is density. And that tells you something about the composition. And we've found some big surprises. I think the plot is really thickening because 
for example, um, we have found planets in the same system, two planets, with exactly the same radius. Both of them are 20% larger than the size of the Earth. So you would think that they would be very similar to Earth, maybe have a rocky composition like Earth's, the canonical super-Earth that we talk about often. The problem is that their densities are completely different. And so what that's From each other or from Earth? From each other, yeah. Okay. And one of them from Earth. One of them has a much lower density than you would expect for a planet that size. Um, and so what that's telling us is that even in the bars that I colored brown that are highly suggestive of, of a rocky composition like Earth, you have compositional diversity. And we're only beginning to understand uh, what that, I'll call it a distribution of, of compositions is, or what that diversity represents, and how often do you get a planet with the Earth's composition compared to other compositional mixes. Okay. Well, that is, we, we, I'm afraid we can talk about Kepler all night, but we're over halfway through the Hangout, and I still haven't gotten to the future yet, so I need to do that. But I need to ask, and from an astronautical point of view, from an engineering perspective, can, some, can you give us... Uh, uh, Natalie, a real quick update. What happened to Kepler? Is it still up there? Is it still doing anything? Is it broken? What's its current status right now? Yeah, Kepler is absolutely still up there. It got a second life. In fact, it's now called K2 after the mountain and after this idea that it's gotten its second life. Um, and after the idea that it's running on just two reaction wheels. <laughs> um, so the, the, the big uh, killer uh, to our prime mission was the loss of a second reaction wheel. So these reaction wheels function like gyroscopes. They are used to keep the telescope pointed with very, very high precision. That's very important for achieving this part per million accuracy or precision of the brightness measurements. Um, so we lost one uh, early, relatively early on in the mission, um, but we had, that was a backup, um, and we had we had still had enough with three. There are three axes of rotation of your spacecraft that have to be controlled, right? And so you need three of these reaction wheels. Once we lost another one, we were kind of dead in the water. We couldn't maintain pointing precision. Um, but the really innovative, um, ingenious engineers at Ball Aerospace came up with the idea of using the symmetry, the, the architectural symmetry of the spacecraft and its solar panels as um, a means of controlling that third axis of rotation. Um, so what they did was they pointed this axis of symmetry directly at the sun. Uh, the sun is actually a source of pressure against the spacecraft. The solar radiation exerts what we call radiation pressure and that causes the telescope to drift and move and rotate and spin and all of that. But if you point this axis of symmetry directly at the sun, it's like taking a rowboat and pointing it upstream against a current perfectly balanced so that your, your rowboat won't sway one side to the other. And that's what Kepler has done, and that's what controls this third axis of, of rotation. So Who the space travel... Who said weren't clever? Yeah. <laughs> well, those are the engineers, to be fair. But, yeah, that's uh, true. The, oh, that's, that's true. Yeah, I should have... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they all look pretty clever, yes. We'll get some engineers on here. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Okay, we need to get to the future, and I've got a great panel of people to ask this question to because i got to tell you, I am always confused as to how this happened. I'm going to screen share something real quick. This is something called the Decadal Survey. This is how astronomers decide things for the future. But what I don't know, and you guys can maybe help me with, is what is the difference between this, doing this every 10 years? Decadal Survey is something they do every 10 years, and we'll go through this in a minute. But And this and the 30-year plan, NASA's 30-year plan. What is the difference? there. Yeah, so um, NASA, the NASA Astrophysics Subcommittee actually, which is an advisory committee of sorts to NASA, they think about astrophysics and what NASA is doing for astrophysics. Um, they put together this committee just to kind of brainstorm and, and do some strategic thinking about what are the next big things um, coming down the pipe. You know, what's going to happen after JWST? Uh, the decadal planning is 
Oh, well, and I should say that this 30-year roadmap process begins with the Decadal Survey report. Right? The Decadal Survey is a very rigorous, well-planned, careful process to solicit the entire scientific community and think about what's been done, where technology is at, and what is going, should be done for the next 10 years. Um, so it's a very comprehensive process. That's not what the 30-year roadmap was meant to be. The 30-year roadmap was just to provide kind of a science-driven, 30-year strategic vision, no holds barred kind of, this is what we want to do next. Um, just to give NASA some idea of what direction we might go in in the era beyond GWST. Okay, I'll let you comment on that 30-year plan in a minute, but let's talk about while I have this up here. Let's just say that over the past, these, are the big, these were the big things that were decided. In 72, they decided they needed Hubble. Uh, it was launched in 1990, and then in 1982, they decided Chandra was the big, the big, the X-ray telescope that's currently up there now, and it was launched in 1999. Spitzer it was decided on in an early decade, in the early 1990s, and it was launched in 20 or 2003. And now we're looking at the la the 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 one from 10 years ago, uh, or more than that now, 15, 14 years ago. The JWST was decided to be the big thing, and that is was. Uh, going to be launched here in a couple of years. So there's a lot of time between when these decadal surveys come out and set their priorities and when these things get launched. And if you look ahead, back five years ago in 2010, WFIRST was the big uh, the big priority. And uh, Alberto, what are you showing? You're showing... I'm showing something very similar to what you see, but it's a little okay. more focused on exoplanets, right? Okay. Uh, so he has something that Sarah knows very well, which is uh, TESS, and we uh, we should actually ask uh, Sarah what TESS is. Oh, but good, yeah. What, this one's better because it's got, yeah, this is more exoplanet-centric. Right, this and what better. I wanted to say, basically, is that, you know, as we talked about, as Natalie and Sarah talked about, the, the, the struggles that they had at the beginning to understand what was going on and and the fact that you at some point you, you realize you need Kepler up there be above the atmosphere to do these observations. There's also... Uh, uh, you know, a greater challenge, and I think I would like you know Sarah to, for for Sarah to tell us about what TESS is all about and why it's going to be also pretty instrumental for JWST and for future missions. Sure. First well, of all, what is what is TESS? I'll tell you. I'll tell you first what motivated TESS, and that is you know while Kepler was a huge success. What does it mean first? <laughs> Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. Okay, Test thank you. All Sky Survey. It will search the entire sky, the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere in big strips. These strips are 24 degrees by 90 degrees. And it will map out each strip. We'll get about 20, 20, 26 days of observations, can, almost continuous. And at the poles, there will be more overlap. And some of those will be observed instead of just half of 26 days, more like a few months. Now, the thing with TESS is TESS's goal is to find stars, the nearest stars, and transits around those stars. Because although Kepler was phenomenally exciting and pioneered the search for small planets, the small planets around the Kepler stars are actually too far away for us to study their atmospheres. And ultimately, along the path to search for signs of life by the planet atmosphere, indeed to characterize the planet further than its mass and size, we'd really like to get a handle on the closer planets. But unlike Kepler, unfortunately, TESS doesn't have quite as good measurement ability. So we'll be able to find Earth-sized planets, but those will be limited to small stars. So TESS is going to look at hundreds of thousands of stars, maybe even up to a million. You know, downlink the data to Earth, and out of those hundreds of thousands of stars, we're expecting to find thousands of planets, hundreds of rocky planets, and for about 100 of which we hope to get actually a mass on. And with any luck, a handful of those will actually be in the habitable zone of their host star, and we'll be following up those rocky worlds as well as the giant planets with the James Webb Space Telescope. Now, one thing I just want to add is that TESS has um, four cameras, and these cameras have um, lenses about this big. They're about 10 centimeters in diameter, and they have giant baffles on them, and there's four of them all attached together. Right now, in another building here at the MIT campus, we have um, the first engineering prototype model, like, not prototype, we have the first engineering flight unit, and it's now being tested in vacuum, just for, to make sure that the lens and the detector behaves as we had expected. Oh, good. I'm glad you brought this up. So where are we in the... So you're, you're saying the prototypes are being built? What's the timeline for these things? Well, the be... prototypes were built a long time ago. There's going to be four cameras, and before the final design sets in, we actually have one of the cameras is built already and is being tested in the lab now. Tests will be launched in 2017. Really? Before before JWST? Absolutely. Yeah, is for tests. Oh, nice. Very well, nice. You have to look at the graph, Tony. Come on. Well, mm -hmm. I know, but your graph <laughs> doesn't have dates. <laughs> you, you no, just, dates. It's a progression, yes. I know, but it's like, you know, I just, so like, you have dates. Exoplanets, the time scale exoplanets proceeds 
far faster than a decade. In the year 2000, in the decadal survey, exoplanets were barely mentioned. By the year 2010, exo, you know, Kepler has launched exoplanets are main, mainstream research now. So actually, wow. TESS uh, is a different type of mission. It wasn't, I, I don't think it was even, um, I'm not sure if it was mentioned in 2010, but it is a, mm -hmm. a great mission. It's going to find a pool of planets so that the James Webb Space Telescope can, can look at the very best ones. So that's why it's launching before. We have to find the planets, and there's right. a lot of work involved before we can wow. choose which ones to follow up. Okay, and we have to. I, unfortunately, I want to keep moving on real quick. I want Alberto. You've got this up. You may as well start talking about JWST then after Tess. So <laughs> Tess is going to lay the lay set the stage. Kepler has already gotten our our appetites wet for that. Got got us ready for more exoplanets. Tess is going to be looking at the entire sky. What's JWST going to do for us? Well, it's going to do something different. I think it's going to take the key uh, findings from Tess. And again, you know, as Sarah mentioned, if we're if we're lucky, we're going to have a handful of candidates that I can actually that we can actually look at and actually. You know, try to detect uh, you know uh, signatures of water vapor, for example, in the atmospheres. I mean, I'll, I'll let Sarah describe you know how we want to do this, but the idea is that basically we can take the catalog, if you will, that will pr be produced by by TESS for this uh, very very interesting potential planets, and uh, really determine you know do they have the conditions you know if they're in the habitable zone to support life. I think it's it's a first start you know in in a race that's going to take us uh, far. I think as astronomers in trying to seek actually planets nearby that have uh, that have life I think one of the one of the things that interests me the most or maybe um, and this is just my own opinion I think where JWST is going to just knock it out of the park is with this gray area in between right I mean JDEV is going to be able the to the area between uh, earth and, and, and Neptune that you uh, talking about. yeah exactly uh, this this region these planets that are so common um, that we know nothing about. You know, the JDUB should be able to um, probe the composition of their atmospheres, um, understand the uh, temperature pressure profile in those atmospheres, perhaps, um, and and we'll te we'll just learn a lot about this class of planets for which we have no example in our own solar system. So, so I see you're real tight with JWS. You like JDUB, huh? You're like, you're, like, you're, like, you're like real tight. You, you guys are real J <laughs> So Kepler did phenomenally, is doing phenomenally. Tess is going to find things. But our next chance to take the next step to actually characterize the atmospheres is James Webb. So it's not just that okay. itself. It's like the entire community is just like um, not yeah. purposely having put all of our eggs in one basket, but we're all counting on the James Webb to move our field forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, well, so we're, we're, let's talk a little bit about the astronautics here, uh, Alberto. When are we launching, and what's what's so what's what, compare JWST with um, with Hubble, and give us some sense of what we're up against here. We're up against uh, a lot. I mean, what so it's uh, it's uh, so Hubble. It's uh, you know, it's the uh, size of a school bus. Uh, James Webb is the size of a tennis court. We need to figure out how to launch as an observatory and to do the science that you just heard from uh, from Sarah and Natalie. Uh, it's very complex. It's a cryogenic telescope, uh, so it operates about a f at about 40 Kelvin. It's not in near-Earth orbit, like uh, in low-Earth orbit. I mean, like Hubble is. It's uh, about a million miles away uh, from Earth because we need to operate at those uh, at those cryogenic temperatures. The good news is that um, it's on schedule to launch in on October 18, 2018. We're making great progress. Uh, uh, we are actually going to enter a phase over the next couple of years, which is tremendously important because, if you will, all the pieces are being built, and we're entering the testing phase of many of the pieces that as they come together. But the of this year, the structure that holds uh, the mirrors will be in place. Uh, it, will, it will then be taken to um, uh, to Johnson Space Flight Center, where uh, it will be put in a very large uh, uh, cryogenic chamber for testing. Uh, on the way, basically, to to build a full observatory. Uh, the potential for I think for for the discoveries that the web uh, will make uh, is is in my opinion is actually tremendous. I think it's going to rewrite uh, uh, you know astronomy as Hubble has done, as Pitzer and as Kepler has done. And I think the the idea that we're going to have a set of candidates for planets, uh, you know, almost in any range, you know, if you will, of masses and, uh, interesting, uh, and interesting uh, pro properties to observe given us by TESS is actually a tremendous, I think, um, it's going to be a tremendous achievement. It's going to be a tremendous uh, way to, for us to, to start what, you know, what happens in that graph that you look, that you look at before, which is that curve. You know, we want to do something different, right? Because after James Webb, and uh, sorry, let me, let me step back. 
before James Webb, we're still not looking directly at any planet, right? We're still do it, looking at planets in, in an indirect way, either with wobbling method or with uh, uh, with the transit method. So what we really want to do, and Sarah can, can can lead into this and can talk about this at length, we really what we really want to do is find those candidates that are in the habitable zone and then perhaps do a direct imaging of those. But that will require a much, much different telescope and a much bolder idea, I think, for the future. Okay, so I, I went ahead and because I, I want to get to, I want to at least mention the words before we run out or mention the names before we run out of time. Uh, I have, uh, this is from Natalie's uh, PowerPoint. She's talking about the planet finders. We've already talked about tests. What's this W first after thing? What is that about? First of all, it's a terrible acronym. Yes. <laughs> yeah, what is, I think we need I, I know what W first, Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope. That's W first. What the heck yeah. is after? Uh, well, it's written there. The astrophysics. Yeah, astrophysics. <laughs> yeah, right. Telescope, telescope asset. Asset. Yeah, uh, it's uh, the repurposed reconnaissance. That's not important. I, I, what, what's important here to know about W first is um, that it has both. Uh, it has both exoplanet objectives. It also has other astrophysics objectives. Um, with regards to exoplanets, it is going to do something similar to what Kepler did. Kepler was chosen, remember, to be a statistical mission, not to find a planet here, a planet there. It was it was a census of sorts. You know, you're you're sampling a swath of the galaxy and you're trying to find out what fraction of stars harbor planets of certain sizes and orbital periods. But Kepler is only sensitive to planets that are in an Earth-like orbit at what we call one astronomical unit or interior. So this is kind of like, in our own solar system, the terrestrial planet um, domain. What W first will do with a completely different detection technique is probe the outer areas of these solar systems. Um, so beyond one astronomical unit, um, where we have our own gas and ice giants in our, in our solar system. So Kepler plus W first will complete the reconnaissance of, um, uh, or the census, I should say, of, of exoplanets in our galaxy. Very nice. Okay, so this is the first time that we've had, I, I, I'm going to try and do this correctly, but we've got a couple of things going on in the Q&A app. Shamir Nepal is asking a question that was also responded to by one of our viewers, and I'll get to that in a second. And he's asking, as large as the planet, let me see, as large as, large as the planet greater than gaseous nature with predicted test yield very large between sub Sub-Neptune and Earth, can we assume most of them to be rocky? I think what he's asking, the way I'm reading this is with the predicted uh, number of planets that TESS is going to be finding uh, can, and, and proposed uh, very large yield between the Sub-Neptune and Earth range, can you assume most of those planets will be rocky? And there was a response by Lauren Weiss who, who's, who's responded um, that based on Kepler's findings, we predict that most of the planet's test finds will have rocky interiors engulfed in puffy, gaseous envelopes. However, tests will very likely find rocky planets around small, nearby stars. So do you guys want to comment on that? Well, what people have found, actually, based on Kepler data, that have Kepler planets that have a measure mass and size, is that for some reason, planets above a certain size, namely 1.6 Earth radii, it seems like they're all with this gas envelope, whereas less than that appear to be rocky. And so Lauren's statements, she's an astronomer herself, um, her statements actually come from this. Yeah. So, although, so these... although keep in mind that we have an exception now, right? I mean, just a couple weeks ago it was reported um, uh, in the Kepler-138 system. Uh, it's a three-planet system, I believe, maybe more, but three that I can re recall. And that's the system I spoke of earlier that has two planets, both 20%, just 20% larger than Earth, 1.2 Earth radius, um, and they have very different compositions. So it's, it's fair to say that planets above or larger than 1.6 Earth radii um, probably have this hydrogen-helium mix, um, these envelopes that Sarah spoke about, the jury's kind of still out on what happens below well, one. Interjection, because we don't have a lot more time. The great thing about TESS is that every one of its um, transiting planet candidates, not every one, I should say, but many of them or most of them, we actually can get a mass for. Yeah. So we'll actually have to tell you right. which ones are rocky and which ones are not or which ones we actually can't tell. So yeah. we don't know yet, but we will. And we've just, you can see, we can argue this forever right now, but we will have the information in the future. And that's why we do the, that's why you play the game. That's what they always say in football anyway. Thank you, Lauren, for that <laughs> response. We appreciate it. And, uh, okay, we're almost out of time here, but one there's thing, one thing I'll... One last thing we didn't mention with W first, I'm not sure if Natalie mentioned that, it's hoping to actually do direct imaging. 
and it should have an instrument on direct it. Direct imaging of exoplanets. See them. Direct, direct imaging. Yeah. Suppress the starlight to take spectra of known Jupiters primarily. Well, now wait a minute. I thought JWST was going to do that too. JWST can do that too, right? Um, not. Not really. Okay, so mode. So that's what. So W first will get us that primarily then. Yeah, it'll okay. Be in that direction, but let's return to the questions. Given uh, one. Okay. Well, no, that that was the that was well. Let me just look while you guys are. Uh, so Alberto, if you want to ask any questions, I'm going to look on Twitter real quick. Make sure I'm not missing anything. No, I mean I want to. Maybe we're going to go back to one thing, which is you know that that I mentioned before. We talked uh, about the fact that the methods that we uh, have been using over the past uh, decade or so uh, for detecting planets are actually indirect methods, you know. But Sarah is starting to talk about how you can actually do direct imaging, and there are, I guess, two two the different techniques, if you will. You can use uh, you know coronagraphs, and you you can use occulters or some in some way that can be internal, external. So maybe Sarah, you can give us a little bit of Just a feel for what you think W first will do. Yeah. Let's just say this. We run out of transits, as Natalie explained, especially the further the planet is from the star, the rarer it is to be lined up just yeah. perfect so that the object transits as seen by the telescope. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, to search the very nearest stars, we really want to be able to block out the starlight to see planets directly. So one way we can block out starlight is with the star chain. Oh, good. I'm glad you got a chance. Yeah. <laughs> We've been right. waiting for this. This is Sarah's special <laughs> <show>. <laughs> Just enough time. <laughs> Keep calm. It is not a weapon. <laughs> it could be used as a weapon. Would block out the starlight so that the telescope would see only the planet light. There's many different ways to do starlight suppression to block out the starlight, and the W first will give us our first sh shot at that. An internal coronagraph will be able to see planets that we already know exist, giant planets, and we'll take reflected light spectra of those. Uh, and we hope that the W first coronagraph can get down to smaller and smaller planets. The Starshade team has a personal hope, for personal professional hope from the Starshade team that we'll actually be able to launch a Starshade sometime during the W first mission and that it will rendezvous. We actually call it the rendezvous mission. We'll rendezvous in orbit and it will uh, line up with the telescope and block out the light. And so W first may actually be our first chance at ever finding a planet uh, like Earth through direct imaging. Okay, just so you get a sense of what Starshade is doing, folks, go outside on a, on a full moon. Don't do this with the sun. Just go out on a night on a full moon and put your thumb out and try to block the full moon with your sun and see how much around the moon you can see with it blocked out. And that's a similar principle we're talking about here with this Starshade. It's designed and everything is such that it is, it will, in, in its distance from the, it, from the, the, a nearby telescope will actually help it occult the very bright light from a nearby star so you can see the planets directly. You know, Harley, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to have a hangout on just the hardware of these telescopes, okay? So, yeah, that, yep, we've got that I plan. Need, we've got that I plan. Need you to, and, uh, yeah, okay, because we need to talk about the... Tony, I want people to understand that. Kepler was really, it seems so, Kepler is incredible, but it's the start. It's just the start to like an incredible next number of years and decades. Yes. So, okay, folks, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to we're gonna have to stop it there. We're out of time, but I want to close with one thing that I learned. I heard Sarah Seeger say one of my favorite things, and that is that one of the things I bring away from exoplanet research is that there are more planets in the sky than there are there are more planets out there than there are stars in the sky. Now I know I'm paraphrasing you. You say it much better, but that was one that was one thing I said I learned from you that I just can't get out of my head. There are more planets than stars in the sky. So. Anyway, this has been a great hangout. I want to thank both of you. Uh, thank you, Sarah Seeger. Thank, thank you, Natalie, Natalie Battaglia, for taking the time out to talk to us about exoplanets. Alberto, Harley, we got the first one under our belt. How do you think it went? I think I think uh, I think it went great. We had yeah. two excellent presenters and, and a wonderful topic. Looking forward to the next uh, few months. Yeah. Thank you, it's, Natalie. It's Sarah. Still says live, by the way, up there. No, I know. I'm just saying. I'm I'm asking you how you felt it went. Oh, I mean, that's, okay. yes, we're still alive. We're about. Okay. about Sorry, to I, that was a that was a delay. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> I'm about. Yeah, Alberto's ready to go. I'm gonna. I'm no, gonna no, I'm the, not ready to go. I'm gonna hit the stop <laughs> broadcast button in a minute. I just wanted to say thanks for the invite, Tony. Yes. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation, everybody. It was a pleasure. It yeah, was thank great. you, Natalie. Thank you, Sarah. You guys, as always, are rock stars. Thank you so much for taking the time out to, to, to teach us about exoplanets. All right, folks, that's it for this week. Uh, join, we're going to have another one next month, I believe, the date. Please follow us on uh, look at my Deep Astronomy channel. Also look at the Future in Space hashtag for any future announcements. We'll be back next month with a topic that we're still working on. Uh, and if you like these, let us know. Uh, let us know in the comment section of these videos. Also tweet us on, on uh, Twitter. Let me know what you think. Give me ideas for shows, and I'll pass them on to Harley and Alberto. On behalf of Alberto and Harley, 
Thank you all for watching, and as always, keep looking up. Thank <laughs> you.